No, send that out somewhere. There's going to be questions. There better be questions. All right, good morning, everybody. As you can see, my title has changed somewhat from whatever placeholder was put in the program, which was like melting in planetary interiors. There'll be some of that. But um, I'm going to use this hour and a half to tell you about dynamic compression experiments and why they are useful in geophysics and planetary science. And this is an unusual area of research, although there are several people in the room who have been involved in one way or another in shock compression research throughout their careers. So it's a, it's a fringe in geophysics, but it's a fairly large fringe. Um, and as you may note, anything that appears as a prolate ellipse in this talk is meant to be a sphere. But <laughs> that's just the way things are projecting. <laughs> Strain marker. So before I jump into shock compression, I want to take advantage of this bully pulpit to make an argument for an area of knowledge that petrologists have kept alive and everyone else has forgotten. Okay? And we'll introduce that using this published phase diagram okay, from a paper in phys a physics journal which is a computed phase diagram of magnesium oxide based on um, molecular dynamics and density functional theory, showing a phase transition from the rock salt B1 structure to the wurtzite B4 structure, which at ambient pressure it happens just before melting. And then the melting curve of B4 structure MgO and the melting curve of B1 structure MgO and the triple point. Okay? Can anybody tell me why? On immediate inspection of this phase diagram, I know that it is wrong. Louder and clearer? Go ahead. Uh, at the triple point, there's one phase taking up more than 180 degrees. At the triple point, there is one phase taking up more than 180 degrees of arc. Raise your hands if you already knew that that was illegal. Absolutely cannot happen. Okay? So, Quentin, who is a mineral physicist, was trained properly to know about this. There is a set of principles called Schreinemacher's rules that govern the topology of phase diagrams. And they are simply based on the fact that phase diagrams are projections of the relationships amongst convex free energy surfaces. And when you look at the ways that free energy surfaces can intersect each other, there are only certain things that are allowed. And one of the simplest manifestations of Schreinemacher's rule is that in a one-component system where you have three phases coexisting at a triple point, no single phase is allowed to occupy more than 180 degrees. Okay? Basically, the metastable extension of the B1 to B4 phase transition must go into the liquid field. Otherwise, over here, it's both stable and metastable, and that's not allowed. So if you've never heard of Schreinemacher's rules, and you've never before been taught that people can look at your phase diagrams and know that you are wrong without even checking your calculations, this should motivate you to go learn these rules, because they help you distinguish truth from falsehood and know what is right and what is wrong. Uh, and they're extremely useful. They're somewhat complicated. Uh, they get more useful as you add more and more components. Mineral physics very rarely works with more than one component at a time. Petrology typically works with lots of components, and that's why we still teach this material. So that's just my plug for Schreinemacher's rules, because you're all listening to me. Now I'm going to go on and talk about uh, dynamic compression. So let's start by classifying things that you might do in high-pressure experimental geophysics, and we'll classify them by strain rate, okay, by how quickly you are torturing the material. So we have a large class of experiments that we might call static. The idea is you squeeze on something, you apply force to it, it deforms for a while, but you wait until it stops deforming, and all the forces are balanced, right? and your applied stress is equal to uh, the pressure in the sample, and then you wait for a while to get equilibrium. You might probe it in C2, you might quench it and take it out and look at it after the fact, but you're not really looking at deformation. And the independent variables in an experiment like this are typically temperature and pressure. 
And temperature is independent because you're waiting so long that your sample equilibrates with its th thermal environment. Okay? We then have quasi-static experiments where your sample is actually deforming during the course of the experiment because you're trying to measure the rheology or you're trying to grow some sort of fabric of a deformed sample. Okay? And in these experiments, the forces are not all balanced, but there's typically no accelerations going on during the experiment. You're trying to achieve steady strain. Right? Um, in these experiments, still, strain or stress and temperature are the independent variables that you're controlling. Okay? Then we move to the dynamic compression regime where things are happening fast. Okay? Where strain rates, instead of being 10 to the minus something per second, are getting into 10 to the plus something per second. Okay? And there are, even within dynamic compression experiments, fairly slow compressions, things with a strain rate of order 10 to the 6 per second, where no shocks form. Okay? But you're still achieving pretty much adiabatic changes of state. You're changing the pressure more quickly than thermal diffusion can keep up, and so temperature ceases to be an independent variable. And you do things like drive along isentropes. Okay? And then at the fastest strain rates, we get to shock waves, strain rates of order 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 per second. Okay? Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about principally in this, um, in this lecture. Okay? And we'll talk about why you might want to do that first before we talk about how you do it. Okay? So thinking about static compression experiments and dynamic compression experiments, why would you ever bother to do dynamic compression experiments? Compared to static experiments, shockwave experiments are slow. You can only do a few of them in a lifetime or in a graduate career. They're expensive, okay, you know, for a, just a routine run-of-the-mill light gas gun shot, you're going to be blowing in terms of parts and labor and time of order 10 to the $4 per experiment, okay? Um, you can't really see equilibrium. If you're interested in phase transitions, they're not going to happen at the equilibrium boundary in a shockwave experiment. Okay? And so you shouldn't use necessarily shockwave experiments to find equilibrium phase transitions, but you do get phase transitions and you can study high pressure phases. You can't really do petrology. You can't really do multi-component, multi-phase experiments. There just isn't time for all the phases to see each other. Okay? And you have, depending on what kind of experiment you're doing, somewhere from 10 to a few hundred nanoseconds at high pressure to work with, and you can't measure very many things in that period of time. So all of these are challenges. All of these are obvious advantages to static compression. Okay? But in dynamic compression experiments, we have several really important advantages, okay? which mean we have to have dynamic compression at least as a component of the world's overall research portfolio. Okay? First of all, you can get to the highest pressures. Okay? you cannot, by any static compression mechanism that we have available to us today, get beyond about five megabars. Absolute limit of what you can do with diamond cells or anything. Okay? It's becoming routine to do shockwave experiments okay, in the terapascal range. I'm sorry if I switch between bars and pascals. Okay? Um, but with something like the National Ignition Facility, 196 gigantic lasers aimed at a small target, you can really achieve extraordinary compressions. Okay. And this has been true that shock experiments have always been ahead of static experiments in terms of the pressures that they can achieve, um, well, essentially always. Okay. Um, there were shock experiments that reached uh, 100 GPA or a megabar already in the 1950s, and the diamond cell didn't get there until the 1970s. Okay. The other key advantage of dynamic compression experiments is that we know the pressure as an absolute number from conservation of momentum. Okay. Whereas in every static high pressure experiment that you can name, the pressure is a calibrated number that comes from some standard material. Okay. And the equation of state of that standard material has either been determined using a shock wave experiment okay, or at very low pressure, up to maybe 3 GPA, a gas pressure rig, where you can know gas pressures absolutely, or a density functional theory calculation. So almost all of our pressure standards are ultimately tied to shock compression experiments. And that's a, that's a key thing to keep in mind, even if you never do those shock compression experiments. If you think you know the pressure in your diamond cell, it's because somebody shocked your pressure standard. Okay? Um, 
it is uh, natural when you shock a material as it goes to high pressure, it also goes to high temperature. Okay? So you don't have to bring in extra equipment like a laser or an external heater or something to study high pressure and high temperature. In fact, you can't avoid it. Okay? Next advantage is that we know density in shock compression experiments as an absolute number from conservation of mass. Okay? And that works even for amorphous materials where you can't do diffraction, which is the basic technology for measuring densities of materials in static experiments. The next thing is because a shock is an adiabatic change of state, we have a constraint on the, actually, we have exact knowledge of the internal energy of the shock state. And that is a thing, an energy, that there is no way to measure in static experiments. Everything you know about calorimetry, measuring energy changes, is all done at one bar. Okay? Because containers in static experiments suck heat out of your sample or put it in, and so you might know the temperature, but you're very unlikely to know the energy. Okay? Whereas in a shockwave experiment, we know the energy. Unless we measure it, we don't know the temperature, but we can actually measure both. So it's one of the only ways to get at heat capacity at high pressure. Okay? And, of course, you know, it's fun to blow stuff up in the name of science. Okay, so here's a cartoon of a shockwave. We have some unshocked material at some initial density, initial pressure, usually one bar, effectively zero, and some initial internal energy. Okay? We have a nearly discontinuous step in pressure, which is traveling into that material at a velocity u sub s, the shock wave velocity, which is larger than the sound speed in this material. That makes it a shock. Okay? The material behind the shock front is moving now in the laboratory reference frame forwards behind the shock at a velocity u sub p, the particle velocity, or if you're a gas shock person, the piston velocity, they both start with p. Okay? The particle velocity is less than the shock velocity. And the shocked material is brought to some compressed density, rho larger than rho zero, some high pressure p larger than p zero, and some internal energy e larger than e zero. Okay? the shock is moving at of order of kilometers per second. Okay? And so, except possibly in transparent materials at extreme temperature where radiation from the shocked material might get in front of the shock because it goes at the speed of light. Okay? Apart from that, the hot material behind the shock is not conducting heat to the cold material in front of the shock. The shock's going too fast. So it's an adiabatic change of state. Okay? And so the only thing, the only change in internal energy that is possible if there's no heat exchange, is work. Okay? And we know how much work the shock does on the compressed material. It turns out we also know the kinetic energy of the shocked material, and so all that's left is the internal energy. So we know the change in internal energy. Okay? So this is an adiabatic change of state, but it is not an isentropic change of state. There are lots of different adiabatic changes. Okay? In fact, the entropy has to go up. The shocked material must have higher entropy, than the unshocked material, or you won't form a stable shock. It won't be a spontaneous process that you can actually drive in nature. Okay. It turns out the statement that the entropy increases across the shock is equivalent, uh, if you do a bunch of thermodynamic identities, to the statement that the sound speed in this material increases with pressure. And that's the normal behavior you expect for almost any material. Okay. Usually it increases line linearly as density decreases. That's Birch's law. But as long as the sound speed somehow increases with pressure, you can form a stable compression shock. Okay? And in fact, it's hard to avoid forming shocks if you have a material that behaves like that. If you think of an ordinary acoustic wave, a P wave, okay, with some wave profile where the pressure is gradually increasing as the wave propagates, and follow that at the phase velocity, okay, and think of how the wave changes its shape. The sound speed is lowest at the front of the wave where you're at ambient pressure. The sound speed is highest at the back of the wave where you're at high pressure and the sound speed is higher. And so the back of the wave necessarily catches up with the front. Okay? And if any P wave propagates far enough, it will necessarily steepen up into a shock. Now for the sorts of pressure changes or strains you're interested in, let's say in seismology, which are infinitesimal, the shock has to propagate a nearly infinite distance before that happens. But for large amplitude compression waves, where the pressure difference is significant, okay, it's very easy for compression waves to steepen up into shocks. On the other hand, okay, a decompression wave, let's say following the shock, is not going to do that because the leading edge of the wave is at high pressure where the sound speed is fast. The trailing edge of the wave is at low pressure where the sound speed is slow. 
And so decompression waves tend to disperse and spread out. They don't steep enough into shocks. So if we think in the frame of reference of our traveling shock wave about the amount of mass per unit time entering the shock front and leaving the shock front, if it's a steady shock, those had better be equal. Likewise, the amount of um, momentum transfer by the shock wave had better obey force equals mass times acceleration. And as I already explained, if we have conservation of energy and it's an adiabatic change of state, we can write down a conservation of energy equation. That leads to these three equations, which are called the rankine hugonio equations, or jump conditions. And they're just statements of conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Okay? They are true across any f uh, shock front of arbitrary geometry, but we usually simplify this to one-dimensional flow, so we just have to write down a, a scalar velocity. Okay? And so the first rankine hugonio equation is just the mass flux into the shock, so that's the mass per unit volume in front of the shock, times the velocity at which the shock is moving into that material. That's mass per unit area per unit time is equal to mass per unit area per unit time coming out the back of the shock, which is at compressed density rho. And relative to this material, the shock is moving away from you at us minus up. Right? This one is a little harder to just intuit that this is a statement of conservation of momentum, but you can see the net pressure difference across the shock front, force per unit area, okay, is equal to mass per unit area per unit time. Uh, times the velocity change, times the acceleration. Okay. And this one is just the work that the shock does minus the kinetic energy that comes from knowing UP. You end up with this statement for the internal energy change. So the rankine hugonio equations, if you count the variables in them, depending on how you choose to count, have about six variables. Okay. Initial density, shock density, pressure change, energy change, the shock velocity, and the particle velocity. And we have three equations that relate those to each other. And so in order to characterize the shock state, you're going to have to measure three things to solve these equations. Okay? And there are several different ways to go about this, but the most common things to measure are the initial density of the sample. That should be trivial. We do that before the experiment. Okay? The shock velocity, how fast the shock is moving through the sample. And we'll talk about how you measure that and the particle velocity, the speed of the material behind the shock front in the lab reference frame. We'll talk about how you measure that. If you can measure those things, you can use the rankine hugonio equations to determine the density of the shock state, which is otherwise a very difficult thing to measure if you can't do diffraction on it, okay, and you can't do an Archimedean immersion density on it or anything like that. The pressure behind the shock front, which is otherwise a very difficult thing to measure. We have very few absolute ways to measure pressure. okay and the energy change across the shock front, which also is a difficult thing to measure directly. It's like doing calorimetry at high pressure. So these things are easy physical variables to measure in the laboratory as you watch a shock propagate. And you get in equivalent information on these variables, which are what we want to know about natural materials, but are very difficult to measure directly. And that's why we do shockwave experiments. Okay. So, yes? Is that something? Can we always neglect radiation of uh, Yeah, heat? so in a transparent material, that equation will start to fail at around 10,000 Kelvin, right? So if you really want to do it right, you go to these two tomes by Zeldovich and Reiser on high temperature hydrodynamic phenomena, and that's all in there. OK, so now we're, we're going to start developing um, intuition about various paths through thermodynamic space, okay, such as isotherms and isentropes and hugonios. But let's start with the path that material actually follows as you shock it. Okay? It doesn't follow the hugonio. That's not what the hugonio is. In fact, it moves along a path we call the Rayleigh line, which is in fact a line in pressure volume space. Okay? And I've derived by separating my steady shock into a series of little slabs and applying the rankine hugonio equation across each pair of slabs, you can derive a relationship which says the pressure of each of those slabs okay, is linearly related to the volume, which is 1 over the density, of each of those slabs. And the coefficient in between is the square of the mass flux through the shock. Okay, so we get a line in PV space. And that's the path that the material follows as it goes from the initial state to the shock state. 
And these states along the Rayleigh line are not equilibrium states of the material. They are not solutions of the equation of state. Pressure equals some function of the volume and temperature. So there are disequilibrium transient states. Okay? And you pass through a series of disequilibrium transient states until you find one that is an equilibrium state. Okay? And that's how you form a stable shock. Okay? And so the family of such stable states that you can get to from a given initial state using shocks with different mass fluxes, the family of such final states is the Hugonio. Okay? So it's a one parameter family of states in pressure, density, energy space, okay? which has a particular functional form that is determined by the material properties, by the equation of state of what you're shocking. Okay? So the Hugonio states, even though you're getting to them through a series of disequilibrium states, once you get to the final shocked state, you have found a point on the equation of state surface of your material. Okay? Um, it so happens that for most solids and liquids, if they're well behaved and in the absence of phase transitions and strength and things like that, the Hugonio, the set of points you can get to by shocking a material, plots as a line in uh, the space that shock people like to use, which is the shock velocity versus the particle velocity, because those are the directly measured variables, usually. Okay? So a linear Hugonio in shock velocity, particle velocity space, which we usually expand this way, shock velocity is equal to C0 plus a slope times particle velocity. That turns out to be a third order equation of state. Okay? It has the same amount of information, the same uh, predictive power at finite strain as any other third order equation of state that you might choose to use, like the third order Birch Murnahan equation or the Vinay equation. Okay? And in fact, in the limit of zero strain, we can establish very definite relationships between the coefficients of the shock wave equation of state and the coefficients of any other third order equation of state you want to use. Okay? So the limit at zero particle velocity or zero strain of the shock velocity turns out to be the ambient pressure bulk sound speed or the square root of the bulk modulus times the volume. Okay? So if you extrapolate your Hugonio back to zero particle velocity, it should agree with, say, ultrasonic measurements of the sound speed or static compression measurements of the isentropic bulk modulus. Okay? The slope of the Hugonio, S, in the limit of zero strain has a particular relationship, or should have a particular relationship, to the pressure derivative of the isentropic bulk modulus. Okay, so for an, a regular conventional material with a k prime around four, okay, we expect s to be one and a quarter. Okay. And at fourth order, if in fact you don't have a linear Hugonio, but there's some curvature, okay, the value of the second derivative extrapolated to zero strain, s prime, has a particular relationship to the bulk modulus k double prime, which shows up in the fourth order birch murnahan equation, say, and gamma, the, the um, ambient pressure Gruneisen parameter. So only at fourth order do we see anything that doesn't show up in the isentropic birch murnahan expression. Greg. Okay. Well, K0S is the isentropic bulk modulus. It's V times dP dV at constant S, right? It describes the pressure change for a unit volume at constant entropy as opposed to K0T, which is the same thing at constant temperature. Okay. And there Right. So if you're if you're doing isothermal experiments, you're measuring KT, K0T. If you're interested in elastic behavior of materials because uh, elastic waves are adiabatic changes of state, actually what you want is K sub S. The conversion between them requires some additional information about thermal expansion and heat capacity. Okay? Um, most people realize that K0S and K0T are different by you know a few GPA usually. Also K prime S and K prime T can be different. Okay? Um, Okay. Well, I think the audience, uh, this is actually an important 
on. Wait. Talk. Uh, that this is an important point that has led to extensive confusion, just as Schreinemacher's rules have within the literature. And in regimes where the thermal expansion is high and the temperatures are high, the difference between KS prime and KT prime is actually very significant. Mm -hmm. And so for core problems, this is something that has really dogged the literature in a bit of an ugly way if you go back through time. Mm. So it has, it, this is a cautionary note for seismologists looking at mineral physics data. Yeah. And actually, you can really tie yourself up in knots if you don't worry hard about when you say K prime, you're taking an additional derivative relative to pressure. Is that derivative isentropic or isothermal? Right? Exactly. Because you can actually have you know, Ks prime sub T and Ks prime sub S or whatever. And they're all different. They're all different. Okay? All right. So let's simplify this with a perfectly analytical case where we can look at all of these different paths through thermodynamic space and calculate them exactly, okay? And that's an ideal, an ideal monatomic gas, okay? The only facts that I know about this material and the only facts that I need are PV equal nRT. The ratio of heat capacities is 5 thirds, which is true for monatomic ideal gases, and this happens to be argon 40, okay? Or whatever. It has an atomic weight of 40. So, Let's start with pressure volume space, okay? Pressure density space would just look like this thing flipped around. We're starting at ambient pressure and ambient condition where the molar volume of an ideal gas happens to be about 0.6 cubic meters per kilogram, okay? The red curve is an isotherm, so we all learned that in high school chemistry, right? That's just a hyperbola. P goes like 1 over V, constant temperature, okay? So here it is constant temperature, compression at uh, 298 Kelvin, okay? Uh, here's what the entropy does along isent uh, isothermal compression of an ideal gas. The entropy goes down with increasing pressure, okay? Because um, the atoms have less space to wander around in, so you have more knowledge, less disorder, okay? The green curve is the isentrope, compression at constant entropy. So here's pressure versus entropy. There's an isentrope. If you look at that in pressure temperature space, as you compress a material at constant entropy, the temperature goes up, okay? If it has positive thermal expansion coefficient. And so if the temperature is going up and it's an ideal gas, so that at a given pressure, the volume is larger at larger temperature, not surprisingly, the isentrope plots above the isotherm in pressure volume space. So at given pressure, it has larger volume. At given volume, it has larger pressure, okay? The blue curve, is the Hugonio. It's the family of states that you can get to by shocking an ideal gas initially at one bar and room temperature. Okay? And the entropy increases along the Hugonio. Okay? I already said that that's a condition for a stable shock to form. And so the temperature increases along the Hugonio more steeply than along the isentrope. And so the Hugonio plots above both the isotherm and the isentrope in pressure volume space, okay? The shock person's way of looking at the Hugonio is shock velocity versus particle velocity. It turns out for an ideal gas, you don't quite get a line, although it approaches a line at strong compression. The intercept is still C0, the sound speed of the ideal gas at ambient condition, which for argon-40 is 330 meters per second, okay? Not that different from air, right? And then the sound, the shock velocity gets larger as you shock this thing harder. Okay. Paul. Yeah. In P T space, the Hugonio is linear. Is that? Um, in P T space, it's almost linear, and that's coincidental. There's no strong reason for that. Okay. None. No obvious reason that I can think of. Yeah, we're not getting very hot here, right? This is just the first thousand Kelvin or so. Okay, the first megapascal of compression. Gases are they're very compressible, right? Okay, the purple line is the Rayleigh line. It's a line in pressure volume space. So what actually happens if we shock this material with a given mass flux is it passes through a family of states here, which are disequilibrium states. They are not solutions of the equation of state of this material. And we keep going until we find a point that is an equilibrium solution of the equation of state, and that's the final stable shock state, okay? So a shock that's going to take us to a shock pressure of one megapascal goes along this particular Rayleigh line and stops there. 
since the entropy increases along the Hugonio, if we shock up to some point on the Hugonio, and then we release back to ambient pressure, the release wave is not a shock. It's a regular acoustic wave. It's an adiabatic change of state. It's approximately isentropic. Okay? And so the return back from the shock state to ambient pressure is an isentrope, a different isentrope from the principal isentrope, because we deposited some entropy during the shock. And so we end up back at ambient pressure at a higher temperature than we started, because we did some irreversible work, at a larger volume than we started. Okay? So a typical shock and release path starts here, zips up the Rayleigh line to a point on the Hugonio, dwells there for a while, and then releases back down an isentrope to ambient pressure and some residual elevated temperature. Okay? And I just want to stress that this curve here, this Hugonio in shock velocity, particle velocity space, is an expression, just a minute, of the equation of state of the material. It has exactly the same information content as PV equal nRT or any other equation of state that you choose to write down. Okay? And so you can't just arbitrarily draw these lines. They are measurements of the material properties of the phase. Um, <clears throat> so I'm confused about how you know, it, during an experiment, how do you know when you've reached the, the Hugonio point? The, it, because if you're just measuring the two velocities, it, right. you know, so how, how do you figure out when there it is, that we're, we're at the equilibrium Hugonio point? For a well-behaved material, the shock front is extremely sharp. It goes from up the Rayleigh line in about one nanosecond or less, right? And so I don't really have to know. I can obs observe and wait till I see steady behavior. And usually there's not much waiting involved. Usually I can't actually resolve these states here. They go, pa they go by so fast, right? There are materials where viscosity starts to matter and the compression is slower than that and you might see these intermediate states. But the system won't spend very long in those disequilibrium states. It, it can be approximated as a jump okay. from ambient properties to a stable shock state. And, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, so the steady, beha steady behavior is, the, is a constant particle velocity? Or? Constant particle velocity, constant pressure, constant density. Okay. Constant temperature. But all, but all a you're well-defined thermodynamic the, state. But all you're measuring is the particle velocity. Is, is that correct? Um, we measure it in different ways. Okay. okay? We, in order to get a full characterization, we usually have to measure both the shock velocity right. and the particle velocity, or the shock velocity and the impact velocity of the projectile in a gun-type experiment, um, or have some sort of reference that tells us that other variable. Thanks. So how frequently, I mean, do you, do you measure? So um, that depends how much money and time and people I have, okay? In the Caltech shockwave lab, on the big gun, uh, under optimal conditions, we can fire twice a week. And we just had a major milestone. Tom Aarons built this lab. That's not my question. That's not the question? The question was how frequently do you, I mean, you want to have stable, ah. constant velocity. Um, that then depends on your detectors and their time resolution, right? And there are some ways of measuring shocks where you basically get one data point, and there are some where you resolve the time history and you can see what's happening over time. And with fast scopes these days, you know, you can get a 20 gigahertz scope and you can see what's happening every 20th of a nanosecond over hundreds of nanoseconds, and you can see that it's nice and stable and well-behaved. That's not always what you want. Sometimes you actually want a transient behavior. Um, what I was going to say is um, Tom Aarons built the Caltech Shockwave Lab in 1974, and we just fired shot number 500. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it, that's an average rep rate of about 12 per year. But we've, we've been doing more like 20 lately. Um, I just wanted to ask following up on Josh's question, so to make sure I understand, that Rayleigh line of all the intermediate non-stable states, mm -hmm. on that plot you showed earlier with the discontinuity, so all of those Rayleigh states are on that discontinuity? Yeah, they're, they're all compressed into that, that roughly one nanosecond okay. And then afterwards state. you're in the Hugonio for a little bit before it decompresses and goes yeah. back down. Okay. Right. Uh, and the, the 
the only reason to make a big deal about the Rayleigh line is just to emphasize what the Hugonio is. Right? The Hugonio, unlike the isotherm or the, or the isentrope, is not the path that you follow in a given experiment. It's the family of final states that you can get to by this type of experiment. OK, so let's look at that in a slightly different way. OK, this is space coordinate going this way. This is time coordinate going this way. And this is any variable, whether it be pressure or density or particle velocity, they all look the same. OK, and so in, let's say, pressure position space, at time one, we have unshocked material. We have a shock front. We have a steady shock state. In some experiments, you achieve such a steady shock state for some period of time. And then trailing it, we have a release wave. Okay? And the way this is set up is, at least in a gun experiment, if we think of this in position versus time, at time zero, we have a stationary target, which is struck by a moving projectile, initially at zero pressure, but moving at some velocity. And they hit each other, and now they're in contact. And that interface okay, has to move at a common velocity. That's the particle velocity. And the two materials have to be at a common pressure, or one of them would be accelerating the other, and we wouldn't have a steady shock state. So we call that an impedance match when at the interface between two materials that were previously moving relative to each other, okay, they're now moving together and at a common pressure. Okay? And so a shock goes forwards into the sample at shock velocity US, and another shock goes backwards into the projectile. Okay, it was at zero pressure. It was moving along. In its frame of reference, it's think, it thinks that it was hit by something moving at high velocity. Right? So a shock propagates back into the flyer. And usually our projectile has a flat metal disc on the front, a flyer plate of a given thickness. When the shock gets to the back of the flyer, it reflects and comes forwards as a rarefaction wave that brings us back down to ambient pressure. That rarefaction wave, okay, which, whose leading edge is here and whose trailing edge is here, is very interesting. It travels at the sound speed in the compressed material, which is probably less than the shock velocity in the uncompressed material. But it's traveling in material which is moving forwards in the laboratory reference frame at the particle velocity. And therefore, in the laboratory reference frame, the velocity of that release wave is larger than the shock, and it will eventually overtake it. Okay? And if we can measure when it overtakes, we actually can get a measurement not only of the shock velocity, but of the sound speed in the shocked material okay? by seeing when that release wave catches up. But before it catches up in a gun experiment, because the flyer has finite thickness, we support a stable shock state for some period of time, maybe of order a couple hundred nanoseconds. Okay? But as time goes on, the shock front propagates forwards at its steady velocity initially. The leading edge of the rarefaction wave catches up once it starts to catch up, let's say at T3 here, okay, it starts to attenuate the shock wave, right? Because the release is actually overtaking the shock wave, and the shock gets weaker as it goes. And if it goes far enough, it will decay all the way down until you don't get anything, okay? So in gun experiments, like I do, because the flyer has finite thickness, we have a supported shock that stays at this stable high pressure state for a while. In most laser shock experiments, which is where most shock wave research is going these days, okay? the, the way a laser shock works, you dump a whole bunch of radiation onto the surface of a, an ablator or a sample, which forms a plasma cloud. The plasma cloud starts expanding into vacuum right away. The plasma cloud starts absorbing the laser before it gets to the target. And as a result, the shock decays from the very beginning. And you don't actually get this stable part okay? that has perhaps the disadvantage that you don't get a stable shock state for a while, but it has the advantage that over the course of such an experiment, you actually sample your way down the entire Hugonio as the strength of the shock decays. So you get lots of information about lots of different Hugonio states, whereas in a gun experiment, you usually get one point. Very simply, could you give us an idea about the size of the region that stays in the shock state? Yeah, physically. well, it depends on your apparatus. But um, typically, in light gas gun experiments, uh, the diameter of the gun, and therefore the diameter of the flat projectile, is about 25 millimeters. 
some people have 30 millimeter guns, some people have 40 millimeter guns, some people have 80 millimeter guns, let's just say about 25 millimeters. Okay? We want to see one dimensional behavior, and of course there's edge effects coming in from the edges of the projectile. So you can propagate a shock over a distance of up to about a centimeter before you're going to get contaminated by edge effects. So your, your, your limit of thickness is about a centimeter. Shock velocities are about 10 kilometers per second. Okay. And so the events last up to a microsecond. Um, and so in this experiment, from here to here, say, is a microsecond. And so this time, depending on how thick your flyer is, might be 100 nanoseconds. Other questions about what's going on here in a typical experiment? There's obviously lots of details. We don't have to get into them right now. OK, so here's a plot of a surface in three-dimensional space, temperature, volume, and pressure. Okay, that surface is an equation of state of some material. Okay? Equations of state are surfaces in three-dimensional space. If you tell me the volume and the temperature, the equation of state should be able to tell you the pressure. Okay? If you tell me the pressure and temperature, the equation of state should be able to tell you the volume. It's a surface. Okay? And the isotherm the isentrope and the hugonio are one parameter paths along that surface. Right? None of them is a full characterization of the surface. They're all lines or curves projected onto that surface. If you want to relate different paths on this surface to one another at equal volume, let's say, okay, or if you want to fill up some region of the surface instead of a path, you need some way to go between these different thermal states. Okay? And the common way that many of us use in mineral physics is the Meagrunizen approximation, okay, which you heard about already from Lars. And so the Grunizen parameter comes up as a way to parameterize the thermal pressure at constant volume, as a way to connect a given volume on the isentrope to a corresponding volume on the Hugonio. The pressure goes up, the temperature goes up, and how much they go up is determined by the Grunizen parameter. right? So this is an issue because here is a plot that I stole without credit from a paper by John Eggert. Okay. Um, temperature versus pressure, both log scale. Um, and it shows the phase diagram of silica. Okay. And it shows where you get to by Hugonio experiments. Okay. These are decaying shock experiments on silica glass in brown and on quartz in blue. Okay. And you intersect the liquidus of silica around 100 GPA, around 70 GPA with shockwave experiments. Okay? But if you're interested in the Earth, coromantal boundary is down here. If you're interested in Jupiter, the coromantal boundary of Jupiter is about there. If you're interested in some super-Earth, its isentrope might go off on this path like so. So for most geophysical and planetary applications, we're actually interested in states that are colder than the principal Hugonio. Okay? And so there's two things you can do. Right? You can do Hugonio experiments, attempt to also measure the Grunison parameter, and use it to correct your Hugonio down to the pressure temperature conditions you're interested in. Okay? When static high pressure people are, let's say, using the gold equation of state, to, or the platinum equation of state to define pressure in a cold diamond cell, right? they're doing this because they're taking the Hugonio of platinum or gold and they're correcting it down to ambient pressure using a Meagrunizen approximation. The other thing you can do is try to do experiments that get off the Hugonio. Okay? Right? Um, and there are several ways to do that. Okay? Basically, the Hugonio is a family of states that you get by shocking a material from a given initial pressure and temperature. And density and phase state. And if you can play with the initial pressure, the initial temperature, the initial porosity, the initial phase state, you can get to different conditions. Okay? Or you can compress it along different paths. So if you want a colder state than the principal Hugonio, you can use ramp compression to follow the isentrope instead of shocking up. Okay? You can use pre-compression, and this is a technique that's been worked out at Berkeley. Kanani is here somewhere. She was involved in this game early on. Take an El Cheapo diamond cell that you don't mind destroying, <laughs> pre-compress your material statically at room temperature, and then drive a shock through the diamond cell. Okay? 
You can also make a metastable dense starting material. And this is a technique that I've developed. We make, if we want to study the shock states of silica below the principal Hugonia, we make stichovite in a multi-anvil device. We recover it. We polish up a nice disk of this metastable material. We hang it in the gun, and we shock it. And we've already done most of the work of compressing it, so it stays cold. Okay. Um, if you want to get to a hotter state than the principal Hugonio, and there are reasons you might want to do that, like if you want to get a point on the melting curve at lower pressure than the, where the principal Hugonio crosses it, you can use a porous material. And this is like the opposite of using a dense starting material. You do more work in compressing and collapsing the porosity, the sample gets hotter. Or you can preheat the sample. And we have the capability at Caltech to heat the sample to 2,000 degrees C before we shock it and to measure that initial temperature. So back to our cartoon of the equation of state. Okay, Here's the principal Hugonio. We want to find ways to get other states at high pressure. So we can isothermally pre-compress. And then there's the pre-compressed Hugonio. It's colder. Okay, Or we can preheat at one atmosphere and then shock, and we get the hot Hugonio. So we can get different states. Okay, And if we have different states where we know the pressure, we know the volume, and we know the internal energy at equal volume, we can measure the Gruneisen parameter. V dp to e at constant v. We know p, we know e, we know v. Okay? So we can actually measure the Gruneisen parameter if we have multiple Hugonios of the same material. All right, I'm not going to throw a lot of equations at you. Just this page. Okay? Um, and this is just an illustration of how, if you don't measure the shock temperature, how you estimate it. Okay? And the way we estimate the shock temperature is we have a thermodynamic loop, okay, which says the energy deposited by the shock, the change in energy due to the Hugonio, which is, comes from the third Rankine Hugonio equation. Okay, we can break that path down, even though it's an irreversible path, into three reversible steps along the equation of state surface. One is any phase transition that happens, at one, uh, that happens along the compression path. Okay. One is the energy of compression along the isentrope. And I believe Lars showed the same equation. If you integrate your isentropic equation of state, if it's a Birch-Murnahan equation, it looks like that. And the change in energy at equal volume going from the isentrope up to the Hugonio. Okay? Um, and that's just the integral of the isochoric heat capacity. Okay? And so if we know the isochoric heat capacity, and if we know the Gruneisen parameter, okay, so that we can know the difference in pressure between the Hugonio and the isentrope, you can determine the Hugonio temperature. Conversely, if you measure the Hugonio temperature, you can determine something about the heat capacity at high pressure. All right, now experiments. How do you actually go about doing this? There are several methods, okay, all of them squeezed onto this one slide for the moment, but we'll talk about each of them in a little more detail. This is a light gas gun. Okay, where we're going to blow up some gunpowder, we're going to get a bullet going fast, and it's going to run into our projectile, our, our target. Okay. This is a cartoon of the very central region of the Z machine at Sandia National Lab, which is a humongous capacitor, okay, which can discharge 20 million amps of current up a cathode, around the loop, and down an, a closely positioned anode. And when you have 20 million amps going in opposite directions right next to each other, you generate a magnetic pressure. The anode repels the cathode. And you can get either ramp compression or shock compression up to some very high pressures. And you watch all sides of the anode. And you spend a whole bunch of money. And you get some data. Okay. You can also do laser drive experiments. Here's a cartoon from Dylan Spaulding's PhD thesis of a great big bank of lasers that are aimed at a spot, Okay, usually on a plastic ablator, which will expand into a high-pressure plasma this way and drive a shock forwards into a sample. Okay, And in this case, the sample and a standard of quartz are being watched for thermal emission. Hey, they get hot when you shock them. And with an interferometer, where the positions of these fringes shows you the velocity of the interface. So laser shocks, electromagnetic shocks, gun shocks. All right, here's a nice animation of how a light gas gun works that I lifted from Johnson Space Center. Okay, there's the whole gun. Let's zoom in on the breech. We'll put in a couple kilograms of gunpowder. We'll close the breech. 
hopefully securely, okay, <laughs> with a primer charge and a firing pin in there. Then here's a step we don't actually do in the lab, but it's useful for animation. <laughs> Detonate the gunpowder. We start driving this piston, which compresses hydrogen gas in front of it. Apparently, hydrogen gas gets more blue as it goes to high pressure. It squeezes down into this little volume. It breaks a rupture disk, and it expands into the second chamber of the gun, launching the second stage projectile, which can get up to speeds of seven or eight kilometers per second. And in this particular experiment, it falls apart, and we make a BB, which hits an aluminum plate, watched by a high-speed framing camera and all hell breaks loose. Okay, so the idea of the two-stage gun to get to the sorts of velocities that we need to reach lower mantle and core pressures is we take all that energy from the gunpowder, we store it in the hydrogen, and then the hydrogen gives it back to us in such a way that it couples very effectively to the solid projectile, and you can get the very high speeds. Single-stage guns where you just blow up gunpowder don't get above about two and a half kilometers per second. Okay, usually, the things that we measure are the initial density of the sample, the shock velocity as it goes through the sample, and the velocity of the projectile. But what we want to know is the particle velocity. Okay? And so we have an extra trick that you need to understand, which is called impedance matching, which simply states that the pressure and the particle velocity in the projectile and in the target are going to be equal after they hit each other. Okay? And so in pressure, particle velocity, space, Okay, we have initially a sample at rest, a projectile going at the flyer plate velocity U sub FP. When they hit each other, it's going to travel up its Hugonio, which is a parabola in this space, and the sample is going to travel up its Hugonio, which is a parabola in this space, to the intersection where the pressure and the particle velocity are equal. Okay, and if I know the flyer velocity, and if I know the Hugonio of my projectile, and if I measure the shock velocity, okay, Pressure is equal to rho zero times us times up, so I have a straight line here. I can find that intersection. And in a series of such experiments with different shock velocities, I can construct my Hugonio okay, by impedance matching. Now, in this, shock, in this experiment, okay, the flyer and the projectile are different materials. So I had to have standard information about the Hugonio of my flyer. But if I do symmetric impact experiments where my flyer and my target are the same material, then by symmetry, the particle velocity has to be exactly half the flyer velocity, and I don't need any standards. All I have to measure is the flyer velocity and the shock velocity, and the pressure is determined absolutely. Okay? So the standards are characterized through symmetric impact experiments. So here's one way of measuring what's going on during the shock wave. Okay? This is an image from a device called a streak camera. Street camera is a camera with a very narrow slit in the lens so that at any given time, the light entering the camera falls only on one line on the film or on the CCD. Okay? And then the old-fashioned way was to have a big hoop of film and a rapidly rotating mirror in the middle so as to streak your image along the film. Okay? The more modern way is convert your light into an electron beam scan it using an electromagnetic coil, have it fall in a phosphor screen and turn back into light and take a picture of that. In any case, you get an image which is position across the sample versus time. You calibrate the time. For example, in the Caltech lab, we have a handheld walkie-talkie which can be tuned to 150.0000 megahertz. That's how accurate radio frequency tuners are. Okay? And you connect that to the street camera, and it wiggles the image. And each one of those wiggles is 1 over 150 million, 6.6 .6 nanoseconds. Okay, so we know the time, absolutely. And it happens that polished surfaces of metals or mirrors, when a shock wave gets to them, they change their reflectivity abruptly. So we're bouncing light off the back of the sample, and we can see when a shock wave arrives at a surface. Right? So here's when the shock emerges from the driver plate, which is flat, so that's also when it enters the sample. And here's when it emerges from the sample, and we measure that time difference. Okay? And you can do that for a streak of hundreds of nanoseconds duration. You can do that to better than a nanosecond. Here's some other things you can do. Okay? You can, depending on what your sample is made of and how you manufacture it, you can embed a series of wire loops inside your sample. Okay? And then you can take your whole sample and put it inside a Helmholtz coil to generate a magnetic field. And so as those loops accelerate, they each generate 
a current that you can measure. And so you get particle velocity at the position of each loop. This is an experiment from Sarah Stewart's thesis, where she had such loops embedded in a piece of ice. And as the shock propagated through the ice, each of those loops started moving. And you can resolve now the history over time, because the loop doesn't break. It keeps working. So unlike the, shock, the streak image, which just shows you when the shock arrives, you can get the whole history and see multiple shocks going on. OK, here's another thing you can do. If the sample is transparent, or if it's opaque, but you put a transparent window behind it, you can measure thermal radiation coming off your sample as a function of time. If you do so at multiple channels of wavelength, you can fit a Planck function and extract the temperature. So here is a shock experiment we did on magnesium oxide. Okay, voltage here is an arbitrary number, but we have these six channels where we're collecting the light okay, from the middle of the visible to the very near infrared. And we've observed a radiance standard first, and then we observe the shock. And so the brightness of each of these channels gives us an estimate of the temperature. And with an error of plus or minus about 100 Kelvin, you can get the temperature of the shock material. You can also see here both the steepness of the shock front convolved with our detector response, and the gradual decay when the rarefaction comes in. But the nice thing about using light to image the rarefaction is even though the front of the rarefaction wave is kind of round, because it's a ramp wave, the radiation goes like the fourth power of the temperature. The temperature goes like the square of the shock pressure. And so these things are like rounded curves taken to the eighth power make very nice sharp corners. Another thing you can do is aim an interferometer at the back of your sample. Okay, and there are two types of interferometers that are used. The classic one is called a visor, velocity interferometer system for any reflector. The trick with a visor, if we follow the light paths around here, okay, here's the sample. We're going to bounce a laser off the sample. Okay, we're going to take one split of the returned beam, and we're going to pass it through an etalon. Netalon is an optical element that slows down the light and delays it. So that when we recombine the prompt reflection with the delayed reflection, interference fringes are the result of the fact that the sample has moved in between those two times. Okay? And you get fringes, which show you the velocity of the sample. Okay? The other method is called PDV, or photonic Doppler velocimetry. Okay? And this is just basically aiming an infrared wavelength radar gun at the sample and looking directly at the interference between the um, reflected and direct signals. The trick with PDV is just that you have to record that interfering gram at frequencies of a gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz, if you're going to see velocities of kilometers per second. And that only became practical recently with very fast scopes. Well, yeah. Just very naively, right? So you showed the gun or the animation of the gun, mm -hmm. and you know things are going to get destroyed or put yeah. impact. So how, how practically do you do all the setup for the diagnostics so that so the diagnostics don't get obviously they're not going to get destroyed. You don't, otherwise. yeah, you don't put you don't put the camera inside the gun. You put no, of course not. Of course you put not. But how do you practically uh, get either, all the diagnostics? Either around? mirrors or optical fibers, usually, right, to get the light out to somewhere where we can put it in an expensive instrument. So um, mirrors or fibers, right? And, and yeah, after the experiment, everything is, is destroyed. Yeah. But the detectors are fast. And so we watch that initial shock happen before the whole thing ends up shaking itself to bits. Uh, what's recently become practical, OK? And I June just sent me this slide at 8.59. Um, is transient x-ray diffraction of the shocked material in the shocked state. Okay? And so you do this uh, at a place where you have either a gigantic laser, which you can use to drive a shock, okay? and you can also use the laser to illuminate a backlighter and get um, x-rays, or you do it at a place that has a gigantic x-ray beam and a relatively small laser, like, the, uh, like SLAC. Okay? And as the shock is propagating through the sample, you get x-rays going through the sample. They diffract, and you collect them on a whole bunch of uh, image plates. And you can actually see debye Schurer rings from diffraction from the sample, hopefully. All right. This is a very new technology. This is really just coming online. But it's very helpful because for many, many years, we've been inferring changes of phase in shocked material without ever really observing what phase we get. We get its equation of state, but we don't 
we have, so have somebody else tell us what phase it is, but now you can start to directly observe the phase. So one of the things that you can see when you do shock compression, one of the things we're interested in beyond the simple equation of state is phase transitions. Okay? And phase transitions can manifest either as anomalies in the Hugonio. Simple materials give you linear Hugonios. If you see a step in the Hugonio, it's probably a phase change. Okay? So for example, this is Phaolite, Fe2SiO4. If you shock it from room temperature, okay, you see initially uh, increasing particle velocity, or shock velocity with particle velocity. Then you see a decrease, and then it increases again. Okay? So this is Phaolite, and then this is Wustite plus Stichovite up here. Okay? And eventually, actually, this step here is real. This is from Wustite plus Stichovite to melt, I'm convinced. Okay? You can also see changes in sound speed when you shock across phase transitions. Even phase transitions that are very subtle in pressure density space, they show up as big changes in sound speed. So this is a classic paper by Hickson that looked at overtaking of the release wave in molybdenum. Okay? And you see one line which was interpreted to be the BCC phase of molybdenum, a step okay, at about 2 megabars pressure, which was interpreted to be a transition to HCP, and then another step to a material whose sound speed matches the prediction for the bulk sound speed, which means it has no shear modulus, which means it's a liquid. Right? So first HCP and then melting, both recognized by um, changes in sound speed. Okay? Here's the first new result I'm going to show you in this talk by my collaborators from Livermore, working in the Caltech lab, mostly. Okay? The blue dots are the Hickson data I just showed you. There's that phase transition that's supposed to happen from BCC to HCP. These are our new data. Okay? We do see melting at the same place that Hickson saw it, but here we don't see anything. Within error, all of these data are consistent with compression of a single material along Birch's law until it starts to soften just before melting. Okay? And you could argue, especially since Hickson doesn't show error bars, about what, whether something happened here or not. But the reason we're convinced that there's something wrong with Hickson's data is that if you extrapolate this all the way back to the ambient pressure density of molybdenum, you'd better get the sound speed of BCC molybdenum. Right? And Hickson's data extrapolate to something else. So in fact, to make Hickson's data make sense, you need at least two phase transitions. So um, probably... Uh, the method is sound, but his original data had larger error bars than were Paul? represented there. Yeah. Uh, just Do you determine density that precisely? Yes. So the density comes from symmetric impact experiments where we hit molybdenum with molybdenum, and we get the density to tenth of a percent from those experiments. Then we come back and we do the experiments where we're measuring the sound speed, but we're, again, hitting molybdenum with molybdenum, and we know the flyer velocity. So, yeah, the density is extremely precise. All of our experiments are molybdenum hitting molybdenum, by the way, whereas several of Hickson's experiments, including the magic one, are tantalum hitting molybdenum. And so the time of arrival of that rarefaction wave depends both on the properties of molybdenum and tantalum, which might be the source of the problem. And so, the, by the way, the reason this matters, why do we care about molybdenum? apart from we make parts out of it in my experimental apparatus, and Livermore must make some part of a weapon out of it or they wouldn't be interested in it. Okay. <laughs> um, this transition here, the shock melting uh, transition, corresponds to a very high temperature, and there are diamond cell experiments from Bowler's group which argue that molybdenum melts at a much lower temperature, such that this might be the melting transition. But if this is the melting transition, of course, there isn't a transition there, but if there were, if that were melting, then what's this? <laughs> right? So people have been arguing about molybdenum for a long time. Um, quick question. What are the maximum pressures and temperatures you've reached in your lab? Ah. With the, with the, uh, in, so the Caltech lab with a tantalum flyer going at 7.5 kilometers per second into a hard metal target like iron, we can get 350 GPA, so basically the central pressure of the Earth. If you have an underground nuclear explosion, which we don't have anymore, but if you had one um, and you hung your sample on a subcritical plate of plutonium and you use the neutron flux to drive a shock wave, you could get to two terapascals. 
And the laser people now are getting, you know, with NIF, two, three terapascals more routinely, eight terapascals. Um, temperatures, uh, so in a gun experiment, you might get at the best 10 or 15,000 Kelvin. If you're driving yourself with a laser to eight terapascals, you're probably getting a million Kelvin, 10 million Kelvin, I don't know, plasma. Paul, how confident are you that the temperature field in the shock-loaded front is homogeneous? That is, in, the, in a world in which we used to worry a lot about shear bands and mm -hmm. so forth under shock loading, and especially as I look at that curve with what looks like incipient melting mm. uh, before that big discontinuity in your, in your highest pressure point that might be in the solid field, what's your current sense on how homogeneous the temperature field is? Um, so I think shear bands are a phenomenon that you're mostly going to encounter close to the hugonioelastic limit, where some of the material is failing and some of it isn't. Right? We're way above that. So I think that particular instability is not an issue. There may be other instabilities. And it would be nice to do imaging experiments where we see that directly, which we haven't done yet. Hmm? Uh, a shear band is a, is a concentration of strain. Right? Instead of the material homogeneously straining, it develops weak zones, which strain more than the space in between, so they get hotter, so you get a very inhomogeneous temperature field. Right, close to the limit of where the material can either respond plastically or elastically. Fed. Um, the mic is off when Greg uses it. Um, so, as a, as as someone who is a non-specialist, if I look at a at, at a figure like this and I see two points. Uh, the ones, the, the highest point that you have and then one of the lowest points that you have that are next to each other and nowhere near each other in terms of the errors that are reported. Mm -hmm. is, is that, and then, and then after that, it goes up again, but then below the high, before the high, high one, there it's again down. What does this wiggling actually mean and how does one interpret that? How do you know? Yeah. What, yeah. So if I didn't put the curves there, you wouldn't know what was going on in that region, right? Um, OK, so there's a couple possibilities. One is the error bars are underestimated. And uh, they're not my error bars. They're Jeff Duens and, and Minta Aikens. Um, the other thing is these experiments were done in my lab. And I see the nice small error bars. And these were done at Livermore. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is when you're, right, when you're right there, right close to the melting transition, probably apparently identical experiments could either pass it or not due to small things, right? Like, you know, um, differences. So there, the X error bars are not shown here, but there's errors of a tenth of a percent or so on the projectile velocity, right? Um, and so you might cross it or you might not. Or the material might not behave reproducibly close to melting. The behavior that you usually get when you shock something across the melting curve is you see a certain amount of superheating where it actually stays solid in the liquid field, OK? Uh, and then you shock it a little harder, and it melts. And depending on how the material was prepared, was it rolled, was it annealed, um, what's the grain structure, the amount of superheating that you get could could change. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this might be kind of a naive question, but it's something I've been worrying, uh, wondering about, um, which is all of these uh, velocities so far are basically P wave velocities, sound speed. And if you have like a melting curve here, is there any way that you can get at like the shear modulus th through well, this so if you do enough yeah. experiments on both? Sure. So right components? at the melting transition, yeah. I'm seeing a P wave, and then I'm seeing a bulk wave. Yeah. So but I'm seeing a bulk wave in the liquid. In the liquid. So you'd and have I'm to seeing do a P wave in the solid. Okay. If I, I've seen claims, I've never examined this data personally, but I have seen plots that show both a P wave and a bulk wave measurement. Right, that if you follow that release far enough, you might see a second wave coming in. Okay. I've never seen it, but people report it. So it, it, it's possible to do it. Um, it's probably not the best way to go about measuring shear wave velocities. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, but the only way to do it is terapascal yes, if, if you Yes, if you wanted to know that. Um, so. Another thing you can observe uh, is temperature, OK? And you can infer phase transitions from the latent heat effect, where the temperature goes up and up and up, and then suddenly it goes down, OK? And so one of the classic uh, 
applications, one of the things that first got Earth scientists' attention from shockwave research was the shock measurement's ability to characterize the melting point of iron, right? Because the melting point of iron is our best bound on the temperature structure of the deep Earth. It's almost our only bound on the temperature structure of the deep Earth. As the inner core, outer core boundary is solid, mostly iron, touching liquid, mostly iron, it ought to be sitting on the melting curve of mostly iron. And the melting curve of pure iron should be an upper limit for that, right? Um, so there's a bit of a filthy history here of large disagreements between different groups. Um, some of these points are associated with people in the room. Um, but <laughs> the uh, shockwave measurements converged by about the, uh, well, one of these measurements is 1986, one of them is 2004, one of them is 1987, um, came to agree with each other and now agree, at least within stated error bars, with static measurements of the melting of iron by various diamond cell methods. The red points are Jennifer Jackson's synchrotron Mossbauer based method. Um, the dash double dot curve is a prediction based on Caitlin Murphy's um, thermodynamics of, of epsilon iron. Um, they, uh, most of these measurements converge on an inner core boundary temperature of, say, about 5,000 Kelvin. There are some people who will still argue for 4,000 but uh, the shock waves and the diamond cell measurements and the thermodynamic calculations are all independent ways of getting at the melting curve of iron. You'll note that all the shock wave measurements, okay, plot along the Hugonio of iron, right, which happens to cross the melting curve in the middle of the outer core pressure range, which is nice. Actually, except this one, the purple one, okay, which is iron preheated to into the gamma stability field to 1600 Kelvin and then shocked by Chen and Ahrens. Okay. It's one of the reasons you might shock. You might preheat something. All right, I want to show you the type of experiment that I've spent most of my time doing, which is measurements of the equation of state of silicate liquids at extreme pressure, which is the information that we need to start to put together models of how magma oceans evolve. Okay. So here's how that experiment works. I take a disk of glass of a composition that I'm interested in. I put it in a molybdenum sombrero, okay, and I weld it in there. And then I hang it behind a water-cooled copper induction coil. I can put 10 kilowatts of RF power through that induction coil, which are going to induce currents in the molybdenum, which is going to heat it up resistively, and I can get to 2,000 degrees although a lot of these experiments are more like 1400 degrees. And so it's sitting there hot. I'm watching the back surface with an optical pyrometer so I know how hot it is. And then I will hit it with a molybdenum flyer going at some kilometers per second and drive a shock wave through the capsule and through the sample. Here's a little cartoon that I made of how this experiment proceeds. So here's the molybdenum capsule, here's the sample, here's the flyer. This animation will go in real time. Whoops. This animation will be slowed down by a factor of 10 million. The one second equals 100 nanoseconds. Okay, and so oops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> Play. Good. Okay, there's the shock. There's the yellow shocked molybdenum. There's when the shock gets to the outside of the sample. There's where the shock enters the cap. There's where the shock exits the cap. Okay. So what I'm going to try to measure with my streak camera is the time between now and now, okay? Way in the back. Do Mike, do you, you said you weld it to, yeah. to the back. What, do you see any? Uh, yes, like so there'll be a little bit of a bump on the cap over here where the E-beam weld is. And so the shock will arrive at a slightly different time out there, but I'm going to ignore that part and focus on the central part. But it's, it, is it symmetric on each side? Yes. Okay. So it, we, it's a, we make these parts very carefully. We measure the thickness of everything. We assemble it as well as we can, then we measure it after the fact. And actually, if there's any tilt or bowing of the shock or of the assembly, and I've measured it in advance, I can correct for it. 
Okay, so this type of experiment was pioneered by Sally Rigdon, uh, Tom Ahrens, and Ed Stolper uh, in the 80s. And observing this composition, a mixture of anorthite and diopside, which is an iron-free analog of a basalt that happens to have a pretty low melting point, so it was the first liquid they chose to work on, the shock velocity particle velocity that they observed started from the known ultrasonically measured sound speed of this material, which is extremely promising because that suggests that these points, even though they're compressing the material in one nanosecond, are observing the relaxed sound speed, which is not necessarily true. But the fact that the uh, Hugonio extrapolates back to the correct ultrasonic velocity is a very good sign that what you measure ultrasonically and what you measure with shocks is similar information. Okay? And they observed an apparent uh, kink in the Hugonio at 25 GPA, which if you plot in pressure density space is a switch from nice smooth compression to much more incompressible behavior. Okay? And this was the motivation for a model of what's happening in silicate liquids that basically said, think of a low pressure silicate liquid as having all of your silicon and aluminum in tetrahedral coordination in a pyroxene-like structure. And it's quite compressible if it's a liquid and doesn't have to obey symmetry constraints because you can bend all of these bonds and shorten the chains. Okay? And you can go about doing that until at a certain amount of compression, if you just take your atoms, your silicons and your oxygens in exactly the same positions and you redraw the lines around them, you find that you've kinked your tetrahedral chain so far that you have now face-sharing octahedra and you can't kink anymore in that direction and the material suddenly becomes stiffer. That was the old story. Okay. So when I got into this business, okay, I ported this technique from our small gun to our big gun and went all the way up from 30 GPA to 150 GPA. And what I learned is that uh, the kink is not real. Okay? It was just these, this experiment happened to be kind of low and this experiment happened to be kind of high. All within one sigma, you can fit the whole thing with a straight line. Okay? And this is more like how we think of silicate liquids today. So I've lifted this figure from Stixford and Karki's paper on first principles molecular dynamics simulations of MgSiO3 liquid, which is a different liquid. But the point is, if you look at the structure of these synthetic, these model liquids, you see four coordinated silicon dominating at low pressure. You see six coordinated silicon dominating at high pressure. But you see a smooth transition from one to the other, where at any pressure you have a statistical distribution of different coordination states. And so you should not expect to observe a sharp transition where you run out of four coordinated and you jump to six coordinated. Okay. So the current behavior both in the computational models and in the shock compression experiments is that silicate liquids compress pretty smoothly through the whole mantle pressure range with continuous changes in the coordination populations. Um, I'm going to skip the story about phthalite except uh, to show this figure um, from a paper by David Munoz Ramo and Stixroot again, which is simulations of the Hugonio of Fe2SiO4 phthalite using suitable functionals for handling the amount of iron in there compared to shockwave experiments on phthalite showing pretty good agreement. Okay? Uh, and this is one of these things that makes us all happy that we must be doing both the theory and the experiment right because they agree with each other. Okay. Um, I'm very happy this paper came out because I've been trying to cite it for about three years. <laughs> All right. Another topic I want to talk about is one of the greatest embarrassments in mineral physics. And that is our extremely poor knowledge of the melting curve of magnesium oxide. Okay. Why do you want to know the melting curve of magnesium oxide? I'll go back to this slide in a minute. Okay. Here's some simple binary phase diagrams got to show some phase diagrams, okay? At core mantle boundary pressure, where we know, let's say, the melting curve of magnesium oxide, and we know the melting curve of bridgmanite, okay? And we want to estimate where is the eutectic at which a lower mantle composition will melt, okay? Well, if the melting curve of periclase is very low, 
as Zer and Bowler said it was, then when you construct such a phase diagram, the eutectic is way over here. And the first melt of a lower mantle assemblage should be nearly an oxide melt, not a silicate melt at all, okay, at relatively high temperature. On the other hand, if the melting curve of periclase and of bridgmanite are about the same, then the eutectic should be sort of in the middle, reasonably close to olivine composition, and you get more solidus depression, so it should happen at still lower temperature. And if you put the melting curve of magnesium oxide where a simulation by Ron Cohen put it many years ago, way up here, then when you estimate the eutectic, it's way over here at nearly perovskite composition, or maybe even paratectic, at ridiculously low temperature, and you ought to have melting everywhere in the lower mantle. Right? So you want to know the melting curve of magnesium oxide so you can put together simple phase diagrams like this. And this was the state of knowledge until recently of the melting curve of magnesium oxide. These are the laser-heated diamond anvil cell experiments of Zirin-Bowler 1994, melting inferred by the occurrence of laser speckle, right? where the heating laser starts to dance around, presumably because the material has melted and it's, and it's turbulently flowing. These extrapolate at core mantle boundary pressure to about maybe 5,200 Kelvin, okay? All of these curves here show simulations by various levels of empirical or ab initio molecular dynamics theory, which every theory group in the world pretty much has attempted, okay? Giving you a range from, let's say, 6,000 to almost 9,000 Kelvin um, at core mantle boundary pressures. This is perhaps the most recent one. This is de Coker and Stixrud. Okay, um, the one by uh, Belanyoshko, uh, oh, that's way up here, is sort of similar. Um, that would say that it's around, let's say, 8,000, okay? And these are um, multi-anvil experiments by Zhang and Fei, looking at the FeO-MgO binary in order to get the melting temperature down and inferring the melting point of pure MgO, and that gets an even steeper curve. So it's all over the place. This is what happens if you shock single crystal MgO from room temperature, okay? It's so incompressible that by the time you get to as hard as you can shoot with a light gas gun, you're not even close to any of these melting curves, okay? So what we've done is we've taken our technique for preheating samples, which we developed for silicate liquids, and we've extended it so that we can heat the sample to 2,000 degrees C, or 2,300 Kelvin. The melting point at one bar is 3,000 Kelvin, so we're most of the way there. So we don't have to shock it, shouldn't have to shock it as hard to melt it, okay? And so we're watching the sample with our optical pyrometer so we see how hot it is. This is a sample glowing under its own light because it's hot. At the last second, literally, we extend another mirror so that the light from the shocked part of the sample will get bounced into our multi-channel pyrometer, which records much faster than this thing so we can see what happens during the shock, okay? Um, here's, by the way, X-ray images of the projectile in flight. This is how we measure the projectile velocity, okay? We know the distance between this fiducial and this fiducial. It's 351.0000 millimeters. We know it to one part in 10 to the seven. We know the time between these two X-ray flashes, which are about 30 microseconds apart, okay, um, to the nearest nanosecond. And so by measuring the position of the projectile on those two X-rays, you can get the velocity to about one part in 10 to the four. And you can see that even though this thing is moving seven and a half kilometers per second, you can get a sharp X-ray image of it. There's the target. It's gonna hit it in a minute. There's the heating coil behind it. Okay. Um, all right, so here's an updated phase diagram of magnesium oxide, okay? Um, in black is the one of the simulations, my favorite right now, to Coker and Stick's root of the melting curve of magnesium oxide. In Cyan is a different phase diagram with a slightly higher melting curve and a phase transition, okay, uh, and the melting curve of the high pressure phase. Here's what you get when you shock from ambient conditions, shock MGO, okay, you would have to shock it this hard to get it to melt or maybe this hard. Here's what you get when you start at 1800 Kelvin. You get all these shock states and they all plot at the expected temperature and the expected shock velocity for solid MGO. Solid, 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 maybe solid, okay? And so this melting curve is inconsistent with this amount of superheating, okay? Um, this shows decaying laser shock experiments 
from the Livermore group, okay, um, which resolve something here that they infer to be freezing as they come down the decaying Hugonio. And this very large departure along the B1, B8 phase transition, which is a little surprising because it implies an enormous entropy of that transition, much larger than the entropy of fusion, which is weird, okay? But that's what's observed. Um, so we shocked this as hard as we could from 1800 Kelvin initial temperature, and we didn't quite melt it. So we went through about two years of work to raise our preheat temperature, okay? by about 400 degrees, and it required a whole reconfiguration of the whole assembly, which I won't go through. Um, and in our new assembly, we get these blue points. These are temperatures coming up towards that model melting curve. Okay? And the blue line is a model for the solid. And only the very highest pressure point here is less than one sigma off the model for the solid, whereas it should be significantly colder if it's liquid. So basically, we still have only a lower bound on the melting curve. At 240 GPA, it's about 8,700 Kelvin or higher. That's the best we've been able to do. This experiment here, okay, which showed anomalously low temperature, which is consistent with melting, also shows anomalously low sound speed, which is consistent with melting. Here's the bulk sound velocity. Okay? So we think this one happened to melt. It might have been a little hotter. We might have hit it a little harder. Okay, so the melting curve is right in this neighborhood. Um, well, all right, I'm going to stop there. Where does that leave the phase diagram then of MGM? That leaves the phase diagram um, with melting curves consistent with either, let's say, Dukokar and Stixrud or Belanyoshko, right in this range, not Sir and Bowler, not Cohen and Weitz, in the middle. Okay, and, and tolerably well constrained, I would say. Okay. I always. What, what would that mean for your eutectic temperature? Oh, um, it, well, it would put the eutectic. Oh, so, okay, it depends on your melting curve for MgSiO3, <laughs> which is a different ball of wax. But typically, the I actually have a simulated. Where is it? Okay. Uh, this is published, not submitted, in Nature Geoscience. Um, simulations of the MGO SiO2 binary at several points in between. Uh, first principles molecular dynamics led by Nico de Kocher. The effect of iron sort of added. Um, and basically concluding that the eutectic is about here, where this is MGSiO3. These are, are these weight units? Or am I just standing off to the side? molar units. Here's MgSiO3, here's MgO. The melting curve of MgO is substantially higher than the melting curve of MgSiO3, so the eutectic is here. Okay. The result is pyrolite composition okay, remains in the liquidus field of MgSiO3 throughout the lower mantle. Okay. The thing you might want to know is, does this eutectic move over so far that you get into the liquidus field of MgO um, or, or ferropericlase? For Hartzbergite, maybe. For pyrolite, no. For chondrite, definitely not. So here's an estimate of what the phase diagram looks like all the way from MgO to SiO2 at core metal boundary pressures. This is a model, okay? but it is, at this point, consistent with most of the static and shockwave experimental data. All right, I'm uh, out oh. of time. so. I'm going to leave it there. I just wanted to add, because I mean, you, you are aware of the data, um, that the data coming out of our lab is very much consistent with the in-between, mm -hmm. <laughs> the two existing static experiments. Um, and if you extrapolate you know, from 50 GPA to 2.5 megabar, which is where about you're, you're at, mm -hmm. it's entirely consistent, so. Yeah. which is nice. It's nice. <laughs> On the other hand, it suggests that it is a reasonable approach to science to take all of the determinations and average them and see if you get the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, it Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there are two options. You can take all of the determinations and average them or pick a single determination and decide that one's right. Yes. And that leads me back to iron, of course. Right. And, um, <laughs> which I can't resist. Um, so 
you know, I just I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, you know, you mentioned the 5,000 K as a possibility for the temperature of melting at the inner core, outer core boundary. There is actually, as you're well aware, a, a static uh, data set which extrapolates up much better through your shock data points mm -hmm. there that winds up with a temperature around 6250K. The reason I bring this up is because folks like Bill McDonough are very worried about the yeah. temperature because it directly implicates the lighter al alloying element within the core. Mm -hmm. The question that I actually had um, was that in terms of the shock melting of iron itself, there's basically at this juncture there is a admittedly ancient Caltech point, and there is a relatively old Livermore point, mm -hmm. and then there is an ancient calculation that you plot. <laughs> right. So when are you going to get around to redoing the melting curve of iron under shock, Paul? So I'm working. I'm starting to work on metals. Everything I've published is all is all mantle stuff. Yeah. But. Um, I'm funded to work on metals, mm -hmm. so I should probably get around to doing it. And um, what I'm actually going to try to do is preheat uh, my iron and then shock it to core metal boundary conditions and ramp it along the outer core isentrope and measure the sound speed continuously. That's the experiment I want to do. I will, in the process of doing that, confirm the Chen and Aaron's observation of the melting point of preheated iron. Um, given enough time and money and my preheating capability, I can work out the whole melting curve in between 70 and 250 GPA using different amounts of preheating. Um, is that right on the top of my list of things to do? No, but it's But it's, it's the most important thing you could do, Paul, get to work. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most important thing I can do is develop an entirely new constraint on the composition of the outer core. And but you need the temperature to do that. Uh, yes. No. Yes. Not quite. Not quite. <laughs> what I need, what I think I need, is a pressure temperature path mm -hmm. that reproduces the pressure temperature path of isentropic compression through the outer core. And without actually knowing what that pressure temperature path is, as long as the, both the experiment and the core are close to adiabatic, I'll have the right gradient in temperature, meaning the gradient in sound speed that I get. Show hopefully will be just a function of composition. Yeah. Sounds hard and a little more second order than the melting temperature of iron, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm just talking. I'll write, I'll write another proposal, <laughs> except you're not going to be on the panel anymore. <laughs> Over here. Except that microphone, that's that side's microphone. When was the last time the mantle melted at the bottom? Hmm. The question is, when was the last time the mantle melted at the bottom? Plausibly, parts of it are partially molten today. I would say when the ultra-low velocity zones were first observed, that was the only explanation anybody came up with right away. Uh, I would say that at this point, the status of the partially molten ultra-low velocity zone hypothesis is very much in doubt, but there are lots of ways to do it with solids. Um, and so I could not say with confidence that there is melting in the lower mantle today. Um, the question of whether there was ever a whole mantle magma ocean is also an open question, um, depending on the details these days of different simulations of moon-forming impacts. Um, but the likelihood that the thermal boundary layer, the D double prime region, those are not exactly the same thing, but the thermal boundary layer um, was partially molten through much, or par totally molten through much of Earth history, seems very likely. Right? Even if it wasn't a whole mantle magma ocean, in interior lower mantle, the core mantle boundary was hotter. The core mantle boundary today may be hot enough to induce some melting. So somewhere between zero and four and a half billion years ago, the thermal boundary layer at the bottom of the mantle was probably largely molten. Second question. <laughs> By the way, I liked your answer. Second question is, <coughs> did these melts float or sink? Yeah, so that's, that's the big question, because if you do want to have a partially molten ultra-low velocity zone today, you need an aggregate, solid plus liquid, Right? Because it's not pure melt, because it does have a shear velocity, a low shear velocity, but a shear velocity. You need an aggregate which is denser than the mantle and will sit on the core mantle boundary. 
containing a liquid which will not quickly percolate away. So it needs to be close to neutrally buoyant. Right? If the liquid is too dense, it's going to drain to the bottom and you're not going to have a stable mush pile unless the you know, topology is such that the melt is trapped over long periods of time, which seems probably unlikely. Um, and so I've been measuring densities of silicate liquids. And this is one of the slides that I didn't get to. But I think I know enough about the MGO, FEO, SiO2 system that in that ternary, okay, I can estimate the densities of liquids and I can do some phase equilibria to estimate the composition of coexisting liquids and solids to get at the density of the bulk. And this is how that calculation comes out right now. This is a figure from Claire Thomas's thesis and these papers are published now. Uh, this shows the entire MGO, FEO, SiO2 ternary in an odd way. Okay? Pure magnesium to pure iron on the iron magnesium ratio here and um, MGO or oxide to metasilicate stoichiometry going that way. Okay. Um, and what's shown here is um, for a given phase diagram and a given partitioning of iron, um, the blue field shows aggregates that are partially molten, 30% molten, and are 6 to 10% denser than prem. So those could be bulk ultra low velocity zones. And the colored contours show the density difference between the liquid and solid within that partial melt. And I get liquids. In order to get the whole thing iron rich enough to sit on the bottom of the mantle, so much of that iron partitions into the liquid that the liquid is 15% denser than the solid. And I think that will percolate away and you will not get a stable ultra low velocity zone. Okay. If I cheat, okay, and I move the eutectic closer to perovskite, and I make iron sort of less incompatible, then I can just find a bulk composition, which is aggregate, say, 7% denser than the mantle, and has a liquid within it which is 1% denser than the solids. Okay? So in order to do that, I had to cheat the phase diagram compared to some fairly sloppy experimental constraints. And I have to have a bulk composition with a bulk magnesium number of about 65. Okay? and a bulk oxide fraction of about 30. So there's mantle, there's pyrolite. The ultra low velocity zone would have to be here. And I had to do a lot of cheating to make it work. So that's how hard I've had to push to support a partially molten ultra low velocity zone at this time. But Paul, to be fair, let me make sure this is on. Let's not be fair. Let's not be fair. <laughs> OK, to be unfair. Yeah. Uh, if you use this compositional model in the upper mantle, you would largely not get melting within the upper mantle either. But that simply e exemplifies how important other components are within the melting system within the mantle. Bear in mind, and this is important for the audience to just be reminded of, there is no calcium, there is no aluminum, there are no volatiles here. So you have picked possibly the most difficult <laughs> compositional system to melt in that has three components within the mantle. OK. <laughs> It's not the difficulty of melting, because I'm not saying nothing about temperature here, right? It's once you're molten, what are the physical properties of the phases? Right. And are calcium and aluminum and ferric iron and volatiles first order for d affecting the density and composition of the liquid or of the solid? And you don't know. At high melt fraction. And you don't know. I don't know. <laughs> sure, absolutely. This is, a this is a preliminary calculation. Yeah. I would love, well, I to, go back. I'd love to go back. I don't want to I don't want to be yeah. uh, really bitchy about it. Right. But, um, yeah. but um, I think the data are fabulous, <laughs> but I do want to make it clear that the compositional Absolutely. system may yes. not be applicable. So, okay, so, so I mean, Quentin's job here is to explain why I need to keep doing more experiments, which is great. Um, yeah, I would love to throw the whole periodic table in here and make make this statement in the natural system. Okay, it's time to go for <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>